Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny Beattie, and former France international, Benjamin Kayser. And those were some of the sounds of the celebrations in the intro this week from Saturday night after France beat the All Blacks for the first time since 2009. First home win over the All Blacks for 21 years and incredibly a first win over them in Paris since 1973. You were both there to tell us Saturday night. Paris how was it uh it was it was a proper night of rugby night it was a proper night um you know when some when an extraordinary event does not disappoint when you've been dreaming about it thinking about it speaking about it for so so long and then everything was together I mean it obviously was produced by French TV and stuff but so I went to see the guys that I normally work with and they were buzzing and they were stressing out about the whole thing and I was joking so, oh no don't 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 fuck up the angles and like, oh, you know it, it was everybody knew how tense and how special this thing was it was ram packed with people but they were there two hours before the kickoff uh, there was loads of shows and you know little things they brought the World Cup I, I, yeah. I, I actually and obviously our, our guests can tell us more about it I don't understand where is that from it's not, it's not like it's the World Cup holders. Yes, of course, it was maybe a, an analogy to the 8th of September 2023, which is going to be the opener. Okay, there's still the, the Gallagher Trophy. There's still loads of things. So they made a huge deal with it. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the French actress that uh, was with Jérôme Cano is the, 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 the girl who's in James Bond. Yes. She's pretty massive. I'm, uh, oh, it's massive. I can't remember really know her name, but, <laughs> but she is pretty massive, I'm sure. But So it was massive. And in the end, it was one hell of a game. And I think whether you're French, French Kiwi or whatever, and obviously we'll talk about what actually happened later, but I think everybody had a smile on their face at the end. Um, it's just one of those games. It wasn't won by a, a silly, you know, penalty shootout. There was rugby from minute one to the last one. There was tension. There was tries. There was, you know, heroic moments. There was absolutely everything we could have dreamed of. So I think it was even better than I dreamed it was, be, it was going to be. You know, when you finish a game or you're part of something, and you feel lucky just to have been there. Like it was, it was properly one of those. I've had maybe three as a fan before pressure. I've had a couple games that I thought that was really cool to be part of. But in terms of in-stadium atmosphere and witnessing something firsthand, like I went as a schoolboy, I watched Scotland beat England in 2000 in like torrential rain and it was madness. I went as a, I was an apprentice player and watched Scotland beat England again in 2007. And like, that's pretty much the third one on my list is France watching watching France beat New Zealand emphatically and absolutely obliterating them. Um, and almost sort of watching the sort of affirmation of everything we've been talking about, but the arrival of French rugby, which has so much promise and so much talent, smashed the All Blacks like I've never seen through my entire rugby career and watching rugby since I was five, six, seven years old. I've never seen them do that. Um, and you rarely see anybody do that. And so for it to happen... In Paris, like you said, like Tim, the, the stats and the things that they've done are utterly ridiculous. The way they, they led them by 18 points at half time, first win since 1973. Last time they beat them in France was in 2000, I think. It was like La Maison was the hero. I remember watching it, T2 La Maison was the hero. So to have been there and sort of witnessed firsthand the manner in which they demolished them was phenomenal from a rugby perspective. And then from the sort of wider, what does everyone think? Like taking my kids to school this morning, the postman coming to chat, everybody's just pumped. Like French rugby's back. There's this new generation of kids that have promised so much, under 20s winners, now in, and they can take on anybody. And it's really cool just to have them. As a, as a neutral, obviously I'm biased because I love my French rugby here for a long time, but I think for neutral and for world rugby, having French rugby back where it is now is just phenomenal. It's so good to see them, so good to see them confident. And some of the things they did on the pitch were insane. And it was just incredible to watch. Really lucky to have been there. We'll come on to the game in a minute, but you mentioned the tension before the game, Benji, from everyone in the stadium. Was there an enormous release afterwards? What was Paris like? Was Have, have you seen it like that recently? I, I, it's random, really, because I think it's what on Johnny touched on. It's not so much the relief of... It's, it, there was no title to it, right? It's not like a World Cup final, no. you win or you lose, whatever. But it's 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 confirming how good we potentially can be it's confirming that we're allowed to dream it's confirming that we're we're, we're still sort of relatively lucid enough or actually not na not too naive to to dream on something that's just completely f fake and pull out of nowhere let's face it we love those boys we, we, we love that team we love the new staff we love everything they've promised but they've won f they've won nothing so far They've tripped over the carpet a couple of times uh, England in England yeah it wasn't far and stuff like that the last Scotland game mate 
you know, we're going to beat them by bonus points. We end up losing last minute because we forget to kick it out. So we're still the champions of promising, but sometimes just not delivering just, just yet. There's been loads of scenarios of X, Y, and Z because other teams are obviously very, very good because the organization, organization wasn't completely there. Okay. But this is the first massive statement. It's the first time you can actually say we're really allowed to dream. And so that's why it was special. So I don't think there was that much relief. I don't think um, th there's just even more excitement. People getting even more buzzing around it. I mean, the, the, the numbers of viewers in, in French TV are getting better and better because they did properly drop. That's the reality of what French rugby was for the last 10 years. I think there's about 10% less uh, licenciés, uh, members, uh, license holders. There's a lot less people watching on TV because at some point you don't want to, you know, see shit, shit games. And on top of that, again, your, your, your favorite team lose. So the, the excitement is there. It's just been confirmed by this proper performance. Um, and there's a general smile on all the rugby lovers' faces saying, they're back, there's more to come. And you two were in the thick of it afterwards. Um get a lot of sleep and it was a double celebration as well johnny your birthday on sunday exactly. did benji, benji get you a candle or what happened Mate, got I me did. a big fat sparkler he did actually he did get <laughs> me a candle did. yeah um I'm really happy with that he got his song and everything no we had a really nice time it was actually quite civil it was late um but i think like everyone was so caught up in it and wanted to party and celebrate so we what do we do? We nipped up to hospitality and Benji snuck us in the back door into a big hospitality, um, one of the suites, which was awesome. Um, caught up with a few of your old mates, Matthew Bastro, lovely guy. Again, I'd spent next to no time in his company, um, but what a gent, really nice boy and really nice to connect with him. Went from there into town. There was a few espresso martinis being chucked down, uh, some candles, some sparklers, some happy birthdays. And just a good feeling. We're out with the commentary teams from Amazon and from World Feed and just everyone that was there and part of it. I would just caught up with it and enjoy Paris. Um, and it was great fun. Really, really good. I think we finished. I don't know what time you finished exactly. I, I got back about six, half six. My alarm went off at half seven and then <laughs> back down the road. Um, but again, we got to sort of finish off and celebrate. There were so many French faces from club rugby and from international rugby of the past that I hadn't seen in years as well because of COVID. It's like Remy Lamarat. Uh, from a time of cast, again, an amazing guy. Um, Antoine Dupont, we got up with them, the Aldrich brothers, all three of them. And again, they're just absolutely loving life. Nothing too crazy, but just caught up in a little bit of what they'd done, I think, and how proud they were, which was really, really cool. Um, and yeah, just a great weekend. It really was a great weekend and good to celebrate in a decent manner. A good kick of it and have some fun, then get back down the road. Absolutely burst. The next day, my wife had organized 25 people to come around the house, which hurt a little bit um, because it was my boys were joint birthday because he came on my, on my birthday. So I celebrated his first, made it through the day, got everyone out of the house and got a good night's sleep. Um, but mate, great day, great weekend, great birthday and good to celebrate properly in Paris. It was cool. For me, it's the highlight of, of sorry, of, after your birthday, obviously, Jenny, <laughs> after, after singing it for you. But so we did get a catch with, with the French boys in a, in a nice place and stuff. And I was just so happy to see them all together. And I just realized that there's, there's a lot of them I barely know. Antoine Dupont, uh, Jalibert and Tamak never played with them, played against them a couple of games. I was probably the old fart. So I chased them. I was barely giving them a two-handed touch. You know, there was nothing. But, but Romain Tao, Gaël Ficou, Brice Dulin, who was the, being called up. And so I played quite a lot with them. And so I was chatting to them. And all three of them was like, mate, you could not realize how different it is. <laughs> They're like, you can't even begin to grasp, to understand how things are different. And because I was telling them, you know, we feel like I'm, I'm so proud of you. And I'm, I'm so proud of all of them. And you give us a lot of love. And, you know, I feel that because we share that jersey and stuff, I've, I've got nothing in that performance, obviously. But because you sell that jersey, their oh, victories are my victory. You know, that's that's how it is. And, um, and he's like, you can't begin to understand how different uh, things are. We used to like each other. These boys love each other. There's like an absolute brotherhood. You can uh, say that, can't you? I don't know if it's a yeah, mix of, 100%. of natural chemistry, of how they were brought up together, whatever. But even guys who didn't really know each other, something has clicked in that team. And that's what really, really made me happy to hear. Because it's down to, it's down to a bit of love. Yes, for the jersey, okay, but love for each other. Um, they've got a huge amount of respect for all of them. Charles Olivon is still very, very close to, to all of them, obviously. So he's definitely not left behind. Um, 
there's this, they were talking to me about, you know, one of the, apparently one of the king of, of a group is Mohamed Awas. Like you want them to have it. Apparently he just puts a smile on your face all the time. He's one of those guys, you know, that just sort of glue a team and he wasn't picked for that game and he could have been pissed off and he apparently helped all the way along and he was 25th man and did the scrums with them before and he's the first cheerleader. You know, you need those, those boys in there. When you think about World Cup, when things are going to get really tense, really complicated, when they only would be able to count on themselves inside that circle look each other in the eye and that's all that matters uh it's going to be key so i love that and then they're also saying about how much of a learning environment it's become so let's face it 10 years ago if you were a french player you would come maybe not international level but definitely at club level if you would come half an hour before training to do some extra drills you were eat ass you were a suck up you were a front of row or a front row of the class you know um who, who a bit of a geek if you stayed at the end to do extras and stuff, it was it could have been seen the same. And then the All Blacks would rock up and the, the guys who played in our clubs and would do that. And then it was fine because you're with Chris Masoi, because you're with X, Y, and Z, you know, and that's how it happened. And now there's this culture of constantly learning. Guys coming up with their new drills, their new stuff. There's no judgment on it. Uh, I just thought as, as a detail, obviously it's a, it's a detail, but I, I caught this. And that's why I asked him. The president, Emmanuel Macron, came to see them in Marcoussi during the week. I've been there when the politicians or big people come. Arsène Wenger came to see us in 2015. Loads of, probably the president once or twice, whatever. You obviously don't speak to them. You shake their hands. <laughs> then you go sit down. He said he had lunch with the Quince de France. There's 70 people in the room. There's 750 bodyguards behind the door. He obviously sits next to the coach. You, you barely speak to him. Thierry Dussotard probably spoke a little bit to them, you know, because he was the captain. Okay, but we don't. And... And apparently then they asked Emmanuel Macron to stay. And at the end, they went in a private room and he was talking about all his toughest, all his toughest moments. How did he get out of tricky situations? What did he learn from us? So there's a real learning moment. Let's take this incredible human being, whether you like him or not, in terms of what he's living at the moment and learn from it. Jean Dujardin, the actor, you know, the yes. guy who had the Oscar for, um, yes. for the, what's it called? The, the movie with the dog where he's, um, he, um, it's, um, how you say that? there's no speaking movie, no mute uh, the black and, and white one. Yeah. The the artist. The artist. That's, that's what it's called. Okay. And he plays around with that dog and stuff and stuff. And legendary performance. And apparently they were asking him, you know, again, what did you learn? You know, there was a real exchange of, of experiences and stuff. And that's just a clever thing. Ten years ago, mate, <laughs> I don't think you would have seen an actor and a politician start to speak to rugby players who probably were cross-eyed when as soon as you were thinking, you know, going more than one plus one equals three. And, and that's, that's, that's the level that it was at. Now they're, they're properly trying to learn to push. Well, 10 years ago, I was in there. So maybe let's say 30 years ago, whatever. You know what I mean? And um, so I was just chuffed to see that they love each other. They're constantly trying to learn. They really believe in what they're doing, which means it's sustainable. It's only a start and they will get going. So really, really appreciated that, uh, that, 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 that change, that chat with them, because it just warmed my heart to know that it's not just a blur. It doesn't mean that we're going to be world champions. Don't get me wrong. There's still far a huge amount of running to get there, but we're allowed to dream. We are. We're genuinely allowed to dream. And just quickly before we get onto a few details of the game, you were both commentating on Saturday night, and I think there's something we should clear up before we go any further because we've had a few comments come in on social media, people saying the same thing. Some of the noises you two were making in commentary. You were getting very excited, weren't you? Is that as excited as you've been for a long time? Those noises were something else. Man, I completely lost it. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I completely went berserk. Like, I got to text my wife at halftime and stuff. I don't look at it during the game, but at halftime, I'll have a look. And she's like, stop fapping, screaming. <laughs> That's all we can hear. Because, you know, you have your, those stand-up mics and stuff. I put them on the floor. You, then you put them down so that you, you know once you get it, that means you want to say something and stuff. And Conor McMamara obviously was sitting next to me. They made the big mistake of having me in the middle. <laughs> there was Paul Grayson to my right, him to my left. And so I was screaming all over. I couldn't help myself, man. It was really tense. It was really uh, up there. There's some incredible moments of rugby, some big old hits. Bloody yes. hell. Anthony Gelon and, and, and Francois Croz and Cameron Vauquier, they were busy, mate. Very, very busy chopping everything that possibly could, you know, get in front of them. There's some incredible moments. And then so it's true that I, get, I was getting a bit overexcited, but my, they were loving it. So like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. The only thing that I'll give you the little thing where I went a little bit overboard is when Ardi Savia takes his yellow, it really pissed me off because that's properly cynical. He's like laying on the floor and that, that try would have killed them because we were at that time, I think it's around what, the 60th minute, 58th or something like that. They were bouncing back. And I was really pooping my pants because they were doing better because our bench 
hadn't come on yet or at least um, hadn't been uh, so impactful. You know, it was just getting it. I was like, please don't tell me we're going to let that one, you know, slip out of our fingers. And just when he, he did that foul, obviously, you know, you let the play keep on going. The yellow wasn't there, but I didn't know that the ref at the time was like, yeah, it's definitely yellow. And so I hit with my hands on the table. I smashed uh, Conor McMazar's computer, who was there with all his notes and all that. <laughs> In the middle, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, get it back at it. So I almost cost like a, a power cut to the middle of the thing. But <laughs> it's, my, it's, it's, it's all down to, to emotions and to, to raw happiness to follow this thing. But it's true. It's the first time that I was following it, like, like the 85,000 people that were in there, 100%. And Johnny, you're an adopted Frenchman. Just before that yellow card, Enter Mac makes a break from his own in goal area. The oh, clip mate. that everyone's seen millions Viral. of times on social media. You in the background. I know, sound like I'm some sort of orgasm. And <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> but mate, it is emotions. Like Benji's hit it. Like it doesn't matter. You're like rugby can move you. It's really weird. But when you see those types of things and types of performances and the way they bought in and scrapped. And look, there's different ways of beating teams, but they essentially just wanted it more. And I, it used to really annoy me when coaches would say, oh, like the opposition wanted it. And I'm like, no, there's so much more to it. But raw emotion, power, strength, and a bit of organization. And they just obliterated their opposition. And like that Intimac moment was symbolic for me in that like those types of events don't happen very often. And that, that confidence and belief and your own ability to, to try those things. And that is a real symbol of where the side is. Look, we're fit, we're strong, we're organized. We mix it with anyone in the world. We win the top 14 with Toulouse. We're Champions Cup winners. And this French side now is here to roll. And that was just, it reminded me again, it was like watching, like when I was a kid, it's like watching Berbizier start an action behind his post and Saint André finishing an action against England in 1991, whatever. Like, is that type of French flair and the belief in French rugby that everybody's a neutral loves to see. And that was what that moment was. Um, so yes, on commentary, we may have all signed it absolutely ridiculous, but it's because we were pumped and maybe neutrality slipped a little bit, but it was insane. It was just incredible rugby to watch. It was unbelievable to be there, to experience it firsthand, to be part of it, even a tiny little bit. It was just so cool. Absolutely loved it. Right, let's get an all black perspective on the game at the weekend now then. And he had a very good excuse for missing the show last week because he was busy on the red carpet at the Oscars of French rugby. But he's here now, two-time World Cup winner and current member of the Toulouse coaching staff, Jerome Kano joins us. How are you, Jerome? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on again. It's very good to have you back. And Benji hasn't stopped smiling since Saturday night. So we will <laughs> get on, on to the game very soon. But I think um, your invites got lost in the post, didn't they? Benji, Johnny, no invites to the Oscars. So how was it last week? Oh, it was awesome. It was... Um... It was good to to see all the guys getting guys and girls get recognised uh, for the awesome seasons that they've had, but also uh, a double up. It was a reunion for the the French uh, All Blacks 2011 uh, World Cup final, so it was good to see a lot of uh, old um, old team uh, old uh, adversaries and um, adversaries. I mean, um, and uh, to see see the older players, old legends that uh, we used to go up go to war against. You're getting used to being suited and booted because you were there on Saturday looking very smart and um, mixing it with the big boys, not these two. You were there with Neymar and all sorts, <laughs> weren't you? <laughs> Man, me and uh, Fufu from uh, Montpellier were uh, sitting there watching the game and uh, we happened to glance over where the, the, uh, the passage of play was happening. We looked over and Neymar was just sitting a couple of seats away from us and we were like, what? We need to head over and try and take a photo. So at half time, he, he shot into the box and we... We squeezed into the box and managed to get a photo of him. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't say rubbing shoulders with him. It was just a, the right place at the right time. So, mate, if that's right place at the right time, how did you manage to get a PSG shirt, shirt signed? <laughs> Were you just so, carrying that in your backpack by chance? No. How did that happen? <laughs> no, my, 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 my wife, uh, she uh, gave my secret out on social media. I, uh, <laughs> I, found, I found out that morning that he was going to try and make it after his PS, uh, PSG game. So uh, I thought if he's floating around where we're sitting, I might as well try man. and get my son's uh, PSG um, top and take it. Hopefully, if I run into him, I've got it there to get signed. So I was lucky. Not bad, that. I'll take you, Matthew Bastard, that you were hanging around, and I'll raise you a Neymar. <laughs> a oh, Neymar. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. 
pretty much. And and you were, I mean, hang on, you 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 came in so shoulder to shoulder for for for, the, for that one to bring the World Cup trophy that you obviously you know pretty well uh, with an extraordinary uh, famous actress who was only in um, in the last James Bond movie. So you're looking out for for ro movie royalty. No man, I was uh, I was lucky to get that gig. Um... Obviously, Dan Carter couldn't get out of uh, New Zealand because <laughs> of COVID, and uh, Cheslin Colby's probably um, nursing an injury in South Africa or, or in Toulon somewhere. So uh, they had to settle for me. But um, man, to be involved with an iconic uh, brand uh, for an iconic event um, that's going to be in France in 2023, it was incredible. Um, and to start off the night, uh, bringing the World Cup in, it was it was a uh, yeah, it was the start of an awesome, awesome event. Did you have a word while you were taking the trophy out? Because Johnny's already must have. Johnny's had a hundred euros on you to be the next James Bond. I'm like, look, Daniel <laughs> Craig's time's up. Da Daniel Craig's finished, mate. Tell me you're gonna step up. She's saying, look, come and have a word of the directors. Come on, I'll get you. No way. No. Yes, mate. <laughs> mate, if, uh, if I'm, I'm probably not like you guys, but uh, for rugby players, the, the last thing I want to do is hop in front of the camera and the press conferences <laughs> and the media days. There's a those are the dark side of the job that um, most rugby players don't tend to like. So if it's uh, if it means me getting in front of another camera, that's uh, no probably the last thing on the list for me. And I can't act to save myself. <laughs> um, no way. Maybe you instead then, Benji. Eh? You fancy that? <laughs> oh, yes. mate, no chance, no <laughs> chance. But definitely, just even you know being being as close. Don't forget about lifting the trophy. But even being as close to that one. Uh, that would have been good. But again, listen, it's it's the only date that I remember. 8th of September, 2023. France All Blacks, World Cup winner, winner. I think whether you're, you're from France or anywhere in the world, everybody wants to see that game. So that was just a repetition for it. They bring the trophy. They want to show the hype about it. I think, honestly, all of NZ can't wait to even to come to France, to travel France, to live the moment, you know, to, li to live that thing. It's, it just ticks so many boxes. That, that's, that's what the whole Saturday night was about. I don't think there was any bitterness on the All Black side, and you'll tell me, Jerome, but I don't feel so. It was on the day, better team won, you know, see you in two years, and we'll settle it on the field. But I think everybody was happy because it was a proper game mm. of rugby because we had legends. Taking trophies because you got the signature of Neymar on that on that jersey. <laughs> well done, mate. That's that's proper, um, and 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 that's it. So it was just it was just a cracking weekend. Everything was all sky high in expectations, and it bloody delivered. So I love it. Uh, I think, like you said, for everyone's thinking about that date in 2023, but uh, to bring it forward. I think uh, the French team they marked November 20 this year. I think they've marked it for a long time and you saw how they performed and uh, and it just added to the atmosphere. Um, yeah, the, they, they really stepped up and I'm sure they marked that, that date on Saturday for a while and um, yeah, they were hungry for it. We're going to speak about Intermark stuff. We're going to speak about Dupont, how good he is in support lines and stuff. But I want to ask you because you see him every day. Mm. I'm blown away by Anthony Gelon. I can't understand how hard this guy can hit and get back yeah. up and keep on going and all again. I know obviously there's likes of you, there's Thierry de Sautoir before in Toulouse, but bloody hell, he is stepping up to the mark. And for me, that was his recognition of saying, you know Juan Smith, you know Sam Underhill, you know Tom Curry, well, I've got nothing to fear. He is, that, for me, I think yeah. he is that good now. He made eight minutes of putting shots left, right and center. I, I hope he's not getting injured because bloody hell, he doesn't look yeah. after his body, man. He's just throwing his head absolutely everywhere. But how impressed were you with, with, with this guy? And on top of that, because you see him every day. And don't forget, his mate Francois Cross is one hell of a mm. player. Don't get me wrong. But I just think in terms of intensity in the tackle, wow, he is a hard hitter. Yeah, I was impressed with the whole pack, the whole French pack in the weekend. And um, yeah, to name a few, uh, Anthony and, and Francois, well, they, were, they were doing all the dirty stuff, all the, the hidden stuff. But also... Whenever Roman or Antoine kicked the ball, those two would be leading the lineup, just uh, looking for someone to hit. And um, yeah, as you said, uh, Jalan Shields incredible. Um, doesn't really show too much uh, emotion like his mate uh, Antoine Dupont, but um, mate, he'll get up and uh, hit you twice as hard uh, in the 80th minute. So he just keeps going and going. And I was really impressed with the way they played in the weekend. It was. Yeah, just uh, seem to have that glue and uh, that drive to be able to just uh, knock everything in white uh, over. Do you think they were taken aback? Because, uh, I mean, as it's not like they would have underestimated France in any way, shape or form, but 
they've never trailed by 18 points in the break. And it was a hell of a wave coming at them in that first half. France have started well in lots of games under Fabien Galtier, but that was something next level. No, without a doubt, they were, well, I think uh, the intensity that the French team brought in the first 20 minutes was incredible. And yeah, I, I think they were taken aback from it. Um, the, I don't think they would have ever um, underestimated the French team or playing at Stade de France, knowing the history of how they prepare and how how we always uh, prepare to play a game here in France, here in Paris. It's, uh, you know, that never would have been in their thinking and their preparation. But uh, no matter how well you prepare, that start that the French team started with, uh, I don't think any every any team would have been blown blown away by that uh, that intensity that they brought. But in terms of overall performances and where this French team has gone to, and I've had twenty games under Fabian Galtier, would you say that's now a confirmation of a French team at a level that we haven't seen for the past 10, 15 years? They've kicked on, they've had different performances and different levels, but that for me was a real confirmation of this new arrival and mm. generation that you work with at Toulouse with Roman with Antoine with Anthony who like we all know are exceptional but maybe outside outside the top 14 people don't really know but that's the first massive win mm. on a world stage against a team like the All Blacks is that now a big sign to the rest of the rugby world that French rugby is back and it's here yeah without a doubt oh, I wasn't surprised by the performance because uh, they've been building for the last uh, couple of years of uh They've put in some awesome performances in the Six Nations, uh, you know, against Wales last year. They've, they've been performing really well. And um, I think for me, that was the, probably the most complete 80-minute performance that I've seen them um, uh, put together. And, uh, yeah, like you said, it's uh, just confirmation that these young, young, keen, enthusiastic uh, players are, are world-class now. And it's someone who was not too shabby in defence and he was making his way in the coaching world. Johnny mentioned Fabian Galtier, but how big a difference has Sean Edwards made to this France team? Sure, yeah, you've seen the, obviously with his uh, impact that he's had uh, in terms of how how aggressive the the French D-line is. They've always, they've always been big hitters, they've always been big men, but just to, just to see the hunger for the, to get up for your mate uh, for the full 80. I think uh, he's made a huge difference, but uh, alongside uh, Sean Edwards, I think um, William Servat's made a huge impact in terms of how aggressive they are around the, the breakdown and um, with, with ball in hand, I think they've been really ruthless there and we saw it on Saturday nights. Anyone that went near their breakdown ball, they were getting, they were getting smoked and uh, I think uh, Sean Edwards and uh, William Servat had made a huge impact. And Benji touched on it a little bit earlier on as well. The foreign influence in the top 14, you were saying, Benji, the culture that that's created has, has changed it for a lot of these young French players. So people like Jerome coming over have had a big influence, haven't they? A hundred percent, mate. Uh, I, was, I was taking the example that t 10, 15 years ago when I started, if you would do, be doing extras before the game, after the game, honestly, it was like you would be taken for the kiss ass, for the guy who mm -hmm. wants you know to rub the coach the right way to get into the team. It was really that type of mentality. French rugby is about stepping up, being the tough guy who, you know, would smash everything at the weekend, smoke a pack of fags, and that's how you prove, you prove that you would step up. And then all of a sudden, I mean, ask the, the Toulouse boys would definitely tell you, but Byron Kelleher, not perfect, but a big trainer. And they always, you know, get things out of him. And he was the first one to introduce, I don't know, ice bath recovery and all that stuff. I was at Cask with, with Massey, with Chris Masoi. And obviously it's, it's not, again, about, you know, what you drink, what you not drink, but bloody hell, he trained hard. And he always did extras and he would pull people, pull guys with him and stuff. So when he did it, well, he would say, okay, right, fine. I'll do it with you. You know, and he just put that mentality in there. It's, nah, it's just about work, work, work with a big smile on your face, <clears> do some extra drills, some passing, some throwing, some techniques some whatever it is. And that really is pushed. And I was speaking to the boys after the game, the French boys, and they were saying two things. For one, they love each other. They absolutely love each other. There's a proper bond between all of them that is more than just teammates. There's a brotherhood about it. That it, it, they play for each other, with each other. There's obviously a big sort of tight unit in Toulouse, but there's more than one unit that's clicked together into this common purpose, and that's outstanding. And on top of that, Fabien Galtier and, and his staff, obviously, and you mentioned all the guys, William Servet and Karim Gezal for the line-out, and Laurent Labitte and Sean Edwards and all those. And they've brought a mindset of per, constantly looking to improve themselves in anything you do. Mm. And if you need to think outside the box, so be it. You know, and, and they, they, they just like get inspired by things that normally were unconventional 
But actually, if you yeah. want to reach for the top, it's probably the right mindset. Yeah, no, I, when I arrived at Toulouse, I think that culture in terms of extras and uh, looking to be the best was always there. It was, it was there when, before I arrived. So uh, I, I think uh, these younger boys had been coached in the right direction in terms of how to improve and how to, how to get better. I think it was just more of a consistency because it's such a long season. Um, the, the younger players just finding their motivation to, to keep their consistency in terms of extras and stuff. But I was blown away when I arrived at Toulouse and also in the top 14, just how young the players were and how nonchalant they were in terms of playing under pressure. Um, so for me, it was, uh, it was a pleasure to come and just witness um, a lot of these players and play a part in seeing them seeing them uh, rise to the international stage and, and now they've arrived and um, man it's going to be an exciting couple of years leading into the World Cup and given your role at the moment Jerome and you see them every day did any of them tap you up for a bit of special advice ahead of the New Zealand game or not no 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 they were they, they just kept talking about uh, how how excited they were to to hopefully be picked for that team uh, that that game, and I always knew Antoine was going to be there. But the other younger guys like Thibaut Flamant and uh, Cyril Blay, they they were always um and you know, always talking about how excited they were, and and from them talking like that, I knew that uh, that French camp had uh, penciled in that that uh, date on the weekend, and uh, I knew there was going to be a big performance brewing. And you mentioned the big man, well, big man, the little man, with the big performances. You mentioned Antoine, and he obviously he's up against Toje, Hooper, and Karevi. For me, he's hands down. There's, there's no real other choice. He should be the World Player of the Year. But in your view, working with him day in day out and having played with him, your view? I mean, you think he's going to win this award? Because surely now, after that performance, which was phenomenal, he's got to be the man. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. Like, uh, I think it was, uh, was a Bruno Driscoll who put a yeah. Uh, tweet out that uh, yeah, it's uh, unanimous for me. Uh, it should be a no-brainer with how consistent uh, consistent he's been, not only at club level but uh, on the international stage. He's just been incredible, and um, I'm he he's the kind of person that kind of hates people talking about him and yeah. and hates the the media attention. I saw him today this morning, and uh, he refused to talk about the game. He just said it was an awesome night and. Uh, awesome atmosphere, but apart from that, didn't really want to rub it in too much, which was a uh, was a good change for for, <laughs> <laughs> for a Monday morning. But um, yeah, he would hate me saying this, but uh, definitely he'll be my pick and uh, should be a no brainer, really. And he's obviously been the captain this autumn as well. Is he a guy who leads by example? Then he's not he's not one who'll give it a lot of chat. Is he? Does he lead by example, or is he a good communicator, dragging players around? Yeah, he's he's naturally a, quite a reserved uh, kid, really humble, doesn't really speak out too much. But uh, when he's led the Toulouse team, uh, he's been really outspoken, uh, brings the guys in and uh, speaks when he has to speak. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say he's he's one that likes to lead with his actions. He just gets out there and and does what he does for the team. But um, yeah, I'll, when he when he has led the team this year, it's uh, I've been pretty uh, really impressed with the way he's. Uh, been quite vocal, which is, uh, I would say, not his natural uh, instinct or in his uh, natural character. If we had the chat before, Benji, and you mentioned Charles Olivon still very close to this group. Is Antoine Dupont going to remain captain? I don't know, mate. I th- I f- I, I, and honestly, I couldn't care less because, because <laughs> he's done so well that there's nothing better in the team. I always hear, oh, you need a leadership group. There's nothing better in a team when you have 15 leaders where everybody will drive everybody in a different way. That doesn't mean you need everybody, like you said, to have a big mouth and tell everybody what to do. But if everybody's driving the collective performance, it's such a good problem to know. I wish only Charles Olivon to come back. First, he's going to have to get back in the team because there's some really good players up there. And he's a top, he was a top captain. He did really, really well when he first stepped in in a properly difficult uh, position. I still have in the back of my mind that February 2020, first game opener against England um, of the Six Nations, he personally killed it, took all the responsibilities at the time where they didn't do anything before. So he's still, he, he's, he's really ris- risen to the, to the occasion. Um, but now there's nothing better to know that Antoine, Anthony Jolon did a good job in Australia. 
that Antoine Dupont get a good job, that honestly Julien Marchand, when he's going to come back, isn't really, really far, that Gaël Ficou in sort of a vice-captain role, leader of defense for the backs and stuff, it's sensational, that Romain Tamak is definitely stepping up in terms of leadership. I thought it was unreal against the ABs. I remember there's, there's this important moment where they were sort of playing a little bit all over the place, sometimes over-chucking the ball, and Anthony Jolon on a kickoff is about to receive the ball. He pushes him out, catches it, kicks a 40-meter out, you know, he's like, boys, let me take care of this. I'm going to relieve a bit of pressure. And he's properly, he was leading like that from the front. So there's nothing, there's nothing better than having too many leaders. Yeah, I personally think uh, who's got the armband is the least of um, the French team's worries. I think um, the, the scary thing about uh, what they've created is they've created this depth pool of players that uh, aren't in the French squad who could easily slot in there and, and do a world-class job. So you spoke about Charles Olivier, uh, Olivier and um, you know, with the loose forwards that are performing, that performed in the weekend. And then you've got, uh, you look at the hooker, you've got Ju Julien Marchand, you've got uh, Bugarit, who, who, was, who was there in the weekend. Those guys could... There's Vakatawa. Uh, you know, Vakatawa as well. forget Vakatawa is not there. And then you look at the nines, you've got um, Baptiste Soran, who, yeah. who's uh, injured as well. So yeah. uh, the scary thing is, is, for the world, is the message that the French team put out there on Saturday, but still have a depth of uh, a pool of players that they could select who could easily do a similar job. And weirdly, not from the horse's mouth itself, but like I got the plane down with Charles Olivon from Paris down to Biarritz. Again, we chatted about it and he's just like, mate, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like he's doing his rehab, looking forward to getting back and playing. But he's <clears> like, look at the team, look at how they're performing, look at the team spirit, look at how much fun it, like, it's not even something that came mm -hmm. up in conversation. And I don't think he would care. The same as Antoine Dupont wouldn't care, the same way Julien Marchand would not care. The important thing is the buzz that's going around French rugby at the minute, the fun they're having, and the time they're having as a group together, which just looks insane. So I agree with you guys. I don't think the question is who's going to be captain. It doesn't really matter. There's fundamentally maybe six or seven blokes they could ask, and they could have co-captains or vice-captains, and they're all part of a leadership group anyway. It's a symbolic armband, but ultimately... They just proved, like you said, Jerome, at the weekend, like they're back with a bang, they're buzzing, and it doesn't matter. And from an all-black perspective now, are they getting some stick back home, or is it just a case of this is the end of the longest season ever, complicating circumstances with COVID, and we need a break, and we'll come back stronger next year? Or how is it being viewed? Yeah, I've seen on some of the, the comment sections that uh, they are getting a bit of a bit of stick, but... Uh, you take those comments with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, oh, I'm really proud of the way these uh, the, these young boys, uh, the team, have um, carried themselves throughout. I think it was a 14 week um, mental um, tour because of COVID. But I, I think it was a uh, it was a good thing uh, that they were able to get in there, but try new things as well. But um, I just think they looked tired in the weekend. They uh, looked lethargic. And um, I, who was, I was speaking to Clint Potrino today um, at, at training, and he said it's similar to when he used to tour at the end of a long French season. You get a tour to New Zealand where it's cold, and uh, you lose the first two games. And then, you know, the last one, the guys are just like, man, uh, I just want to just want to play this as best as possible and then just get home and have a rest. But, um, yeah, I'm not, not making excuses for, for the All Blacks loss, but because the French team didn't allow them to play play the way they wanted to play. But, yeah, it's just for me, it just seemed like the boys were um, a little bit fatigued from travelling, being stuck in a bubble for 14 weeks. And um, and then you come up against a hungry, uh, ferocious French team, which uh, just added to it. And it's not been a bad season. <laughs> they lost a couple of games at the end, but they won the rugby championship. Generally, the All Blacks had a a decent year. Johnny mentioned the World Player of the Year nominations earlier on. Are you surprised? No All Blacks and they won the Rugby Championship. No mm. South Africans, they beat the Lions. Are you surprised that maybe there isn't some recognition there? Um, I think the only one that I would have put in there was um, Adi Sevier. I think he's been phenomenal for the All Blacks, but I'm not going to argue against the, the nominations that they've got because those guys have been incredible. Um, all the players that were nominated. And um, yeah, I, if anyone, I would have put Adi Sevier, but yeah, I'm not 
I'm not disagreeing with who, who they've selected because those guys have been world class uh, for the last couple of years. And there's a lot of talk at the moment, of course, after this weekend about a shift in power from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere. I'm guessing that'll just motivate the All Blacks even further ahead of next year and the World Cup in a couple of years' time. No, I think rightly so. I think uh, the Six Nations have been um, really competitive and uh, the team's have been putting out some solid uh, solid performances and results. And I think the weekend just confirmed that, that uh, you know, the Northern Hemisphere teams are uh, kind of setting the standard at the moment. And um, I think uh, the only thing that'll make it better is if the Southern Hemisphere teams tour here more often. So, um, yeah, I'd like to see another All Black uh, French game next November to try and make things more interesting for 2023. But, um, yeah. So you can hang out with the Bond chicks again, John. Come on, (laughs) This is desperation. (laughs) You read through that message. (laughs) Mate, by that time you'll be Bond. Don't worry. We've sent the feelers out. It'll be done. Um, Mate, I want to really quick you ask about one of the boys who I was really impressed with the weekend. Um, I'm not sure if you played against him or not when he was at, yeah, you would have when he was at Bordeaux, but Cameron Walkie, who normally plays back row, yeah. but stepped up again, playing loose head lock, and for me, was absolutely phenomenal. Like You've got that power we talked about, Jelange, Aldrich mm-hmm. in the back row, who were freakishly good. Yeah. Cameron Walkie is another guy for me who stood out for different reasons, combines that rangy, leggy pace that he has with aerial ability, disruption at line at time, and an all-round athlete. He's another one for me. I want to ask mm-hmm. you how think you good he, he can be. I always knew he was going to be a good player. I, my first year, 2018, 2019, we played in Bordeaux and um, they were blowing us away in the first half and we were trailing 30 points to five at halftime. And uh, he was the reason why they were, they were smoking us. He was uh, winning the contact, running out wide. And and um, I'd kind of seen him briefly in the under-20s a year before that. And um, I knew he was a special player, but when I played against him, uh, against Bordeaux, he was uh, incredible. And uh, um, always kept a close eye on uh, how he's developed and how he's been going. But uh, I, I think he's an awesome number six um, flanker. But what he showed in the weekend, he just added the strength to his bow. And, man, he was impressive, uh, solid, and uh, formed a great partnership with um, Willemsa. So, um, yeah, I've been really impressed with him, and uh, I think he'll be on the international stage for a while. And we haven't really mentioned Roman Entomac yet. I mean, <clears throat> that was a statement performance by him. Obviously, he was in tandem with Matthew Jalibert before the All Black game this autumn. Fabian changed it. You know him well, and you've played with a lot of good tens. How good is he, and does he care where he plays? I haven't really had that conversation with him, but, um, yeah, I was... Uh, Really happy with him. Um, really happy for him that he had that game. Obviously, there was a big debate uh, leading in, and um, just his combination with Antoine, just uh, controlling everything, and how man that run out of his try line uh, to put um, uh, Jamine into space was incredible. Um, but so just the way he controlled the game, um, uh, drove the team around was uh, was incredible, and I'm really happy for him the way he was able to put out a performance like that and so um yeah i, I don't think uh, he minds either 10 or 12 but um the way he played in the weekend i'm sure teens is uh is preferred you talk about it with a lot of pride because you know these guys well was, mm. was there any divided loyalties at the weekend well not really um oh, obviously my heart my heart is uh black but i was just um uh, I was always there to support the guys that I, I know really closely and um, to name the, the start to losing guys. But yeah, just being here in France and uh, experiencing the French life, French uh, French rugby, it was, it was, for me, it was just good to sit back and just be a spectator. Not really anyone that has to pick a side, just to enjoy the atmosphere, enjoy the events. And um, although I was disappointed as a as an all-black supporter, but uh, just really happy with the with the way the French team were able to perform for the public and um, uh, for themselves, really. And it's been mm. pretty much a year since we had you last on, and you've now become Coach Kano. So <laughs> how, how's the transition been? Are you enjoying it now on the, another side of the, the whitewash and, and getting to lead that group of men at Toulouse? Are you enjoying the challenge? Man, I'm really enjoying it. Um, uh, learning lots. It's um, 
it's a real uh, mind shift change when you when you shift over because um, you always have to think about uh, 30 other players or 50 other players in my case but um where when I was playing you just worry about yourself what you need to do to be the best on the weekend and and that was it but to now you have to worry about in terms of uh, monitoring certain players uh, how you approach a certain player to get the best out of them. So for me, it's a huge learning process, but uh, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, my French needs to improve a little bit to, to get the most out of the Espoir boys, but um, yeah, it'll get there. Are you missing playing or are you, you quite happy to be done? Oh, no. I see some of the contacts in the top 14. <laughs> exactly. and also, I saw that in the weekend. I'm, I'm glad I'm not over the other side of the white lines. It's some of the contacts and the collisions are brutal and I'm happy waking up on a Sunday being able to walk normally instead of a 60 year old man <laughs> would you miss training against Anthony Genon Johnny nah he humiliated he humili <laughs> I told you he, he humiliated me in his first preseason at cast as well because I'm there old duffer training with it was Matthew Babio and Anthony Gelange and and these kids are like I'm trying to chase them around a 400 meter track like they were so far ahead of me athletically so no I don't miss it but I find it amazing how everyone you speak to you get caught in pro rugby and you get used to tackling and condition your body and it's just the norm as soon as everyone's done and they watch it on tv and they're not part of it they're like what the fuck are we doing yeah like, it's ridiculous when you step back and see actually what everyone does to their bodies and the contacts and the collisions you just you just think so glad to be finished and like you said so glad you can walk properly or you can get down the floor and play with your kids and all that stuff, you get a bit more energy, so you're a bit more present at home. Stupid stuff, but no, I, I don't miss it at all either. Um, it's definitely a young man's sport, um, so power to them. Good luck. I'm glad I, to be done. I had to, I had to run a drill uh, a couple of months ago, and um, I had to, we didn't have enough numbers to hold the pads, so I had to, for a rough drill, I had to hold the pads, and they had to clean me out, and I saw Cyril Bay and Anthony Jalanch coming for me. Before I knew it, my legs were over my head and I was, <laughs> I was two metres back. So after that, I was like, yep, someone else can hold the pads after this. <laughs> Don't miss it. And we've got to ask you about the end of last season as well. We had Joe Takori on. We've had a few other Toulouse boys on talking about the celebrations. You won the lot. You were carried off on everyone's shoulders. I mean, how special was that to end your career? And a glittering career, where does that rank winning the double with Toulouse where does that rank in the list of all the achievements man it's uh it was definitely up there it's um right up the top there it was uh special with this group of guys um I never really imagined myself uh finishing like that with a, a European and a top 14 but uh, to be able to do that and uh with a with such a awesome group it was it was special um I really felt for uh my mate um Johan Uge who couldn't finish on his terms and uh, get out there and play but I'm just glad that we were able to do the job to, uh, to be able to celebrate with them together so yeah for me I felt, felt quite lucky and it was a really special way to go out Well thanks ever so much for coming on the show again Jerome and sharing your insight with us um, good luck with the coaching or becoming James Bond whichever <laughs> Thanks guys thanks for having me always a pleasure Pleasure mate cheers Jerome Cheers, guys. Take care, mate. Thanks, Total legend. And him talking about how he's going to have to learn how to get the best out of other people. Mate, he's such an emotionally intelligent, articulate, decent bloke. And he's been a leader throughout his entire career. So he'll be absolutely awesome as a coach. Like Even the way he was mentioning Uge at the end, like not actually about him going out, but feeling bad about the books around him that weren't able to celebrate and be part of it. He's just a legend. He's a monster. And you can see how much, A, the all-black rugby public loved him outside the stadium when they got a glimpse of him at the weekend, but the French rugby public as well, how much they appreciate him, how well the coaches, how highly the regard they hold him in. Like, he's just a machine and a really nice bloke. So great to have him on. We talked about France's fast start with Jerome, which has become a, a theme under Fabien Galtier, really. They always seem to start well, be ahead at half time, But that third quarter... Benji, how nervous were you around that 60-minute mark? And then the break that we spoke about, Roman Entermax break. Has there ever been a bigger or more sort of obvious turning point in the game than that? Because that happened and then the game just seemed to flip back, the momentum in France's favour. Well, there's a couple of turning points, but the, the number one thing to say is that, the, like I said to you last week, the All Blacks are not a team you can win by one point. You need, always constantly need to be 
uh, over eight. Look how fast they can score. Although you did try. predict. Although in your sure, detailed sure, sure, prediction. Sure, 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 sure. Fine. <laughs> you let's, said let's a point. Into details, <laughs> I also said there was 99% chance that Jelly Bear and Nintendo were going to play together. Right? <laughs> so th- thanks for rubbing it in. <laughs> um, but but um, it's, it's the, the, the reality is that you, you cannot let them be within reach of winning. Otherwise, you're dead meat. Yeah. And, and look, at halftime, they were cooked, right? They still have a line out that they cock up in the half uh, on the blind side, that little interplay with, uh, I can't remember who drops it. I think it's Ali Savea or something. No, it's Dan Coles. Dan Coles steps somebody and then they, they rip the ball again. What, a meter away from the line, six meters, six minutes before halftime. That would have been the game changer again. At halftime, you rock up, you're completely in the lead. You, you, you're about to pull them apart and then it score two tries consecutively in 10 minutes. Oh shit, they're back. You don't know what happens. Yes, I think there was a clear mistake by the touch judge um, obviously, Luke Pierce, not to have a look at that 50-22 when it, for me personally, bounces on 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 the ball on the on the line, so it would have been straight out kick. But obviously, he was he was standing in a better position than, than I was, so so we'll, we'll trust him. And then they score, you know. So it's you could see that the momentum was changing. But I think when you've got so much respect, and you know how good these guys can be at the end of a very long season. They were a little bit in that fright mode of saying, we're actually losing this, the, the ABs. So let's go full tilt, empty the tank. We'll see what happens. That was the mode. But there was Romain Tamak pivoting in the half, uh, in, in, in his end zone. There's the intercept try by Damian Peno, but there's oh. also the constant mindset of saying, and there's obviously defending that line out uh, just before halftime. But there's the constant mindset of saying, whether it's five points, 10 points, 15 points, you cannot stop playing against these guys. If you start trying to control the game, you're doomed. If you try to say that we'll go from penalty to penalty, you're doomed. If, if you try to say that you, we, you can just keep them for three points away, you are doomed. So I think that it was very cleverly done. I think the impact of the bench was very good. Massive. Luckily, Dylan Cretin steals a beautiful ball in the ruck for the, in the last minute. Um, uh, Thibaut, Thibaut Flamand did really well. The one important scrum five meters out, Five meters out, Jean-Baptiste Gros, uh, who, what's his name, Gaetan Barlow, and Dabamba, Demba Bemba. Demba Bemba did really well, picked with good, good pick and goes around the rock and stuff. That strategy of playing 6 2 really, were, really, really, really paid off. So, um, so some, some strong calls, some, some, some strong performances, but just not one. 15 key moments in that game. The, obviously, the shiniest and the most beautiful one was by a mile, uh, Romain Tamak, but it's, uh, it's just a symbol. And we did chat last week, and you two were convinced that the Entermac Jolly Bear partnership was here to stay. I'm sure most people <laughs> we thought the same. <laughs> I'm sure most people thought the same. But was it a masterstroke to bring Jonathan Dante in? Because I suppose as a coach, you look at what Eddie Jones gets criticised for a lot, and it is being persistent. It's sticking with with things when perhaps you shouldn't. Fabian Galtier had he looked at their combination and thought. Do you know what? For this game, whether he goes back to it or not, Jonathan Dante is the man. No, I, th- I, th- I think it's a, to be totally honest, whether it's Fabian Galtier or his whole staff, let's not forget he, he doesn't take all the decisions on his own. For me, it was a master, master play. It really was a clever thing to do. Forget about the press, forget about the pressure, forget about what's been done before. Focus on who you got uh, in front of you and deal with it. And I, I, I almost as a joke, the conditioner um, with Thibaut Giroud is Nicolas Jean-Jean. You know, he's a 20 caps for France and I play with him in the stands. And I was saying, did they have a fallout or something? Did Jalibert, you know, crack a bad joke? He's like, mate, all they looked at is the fact that they play too much behind the defense against Argentina and even against Georgia, way too much behind the defense. Against New Zealand, you need to play in the defense, in front of the defense, and you need a big guy. And Jonathan Dante, there's one thing he brings. He's, he's one big guy. <laughs> he's a dump truck. He is, he is one big guy. And he had a proper game too. Woo. He was he he was a handful. So no no a, a, a very very clever power move to do so a power move to keep uh, Voki there because he needed his agility and his capacity to do it a power move to trust well, even though Julien Marchand was injured but then they seemed to put a really good space Peato Movaka because in terms of attitude he was spot on uh, so. Winnie Antonio, I thought they had a good game in in the moments where he was needed and his made his his, his presence felt. No, they, they've, they've taken some good decisions and it's paying off. Peter Movaka, the first Frenchman to score a double against the All Blacks since. Serge Blanca? Not, not me. In 1989. Insane. Um, no, I agree. Complete masterstroke to bring him back in. But when you look at the performance globally, 
you could have had Jonathan Dante, you could have had like anybody. They played so well together in pretty much every single facet of the game. It didn't matter. They were that good. And I, I'm, I'm not sure we'll see it again for a very, very long time, a team dominating the All Blacks like that. So again, goes right back to what we said at the start. Special to be there. Absolutely incredible performance for France. And again, I'm not sure we'll see it again. It was that good. It was that good from A to Z. The defence, the blitz, the pressure, the way they dismantled the ABs, um, utterly ridiculous. It was amazing. And you mentioned earlier on, Benji, it wasn't a World Cup, a knockout game, but where does it rank in terms of the list of the top France performances that that you've seen in your lifetime? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I haven't really asked myself where do I rank in compared to others. It's completely different. It doesn't feel as good as the 99 semi-final in Twickenham. No. Um, but but it's definitely top 10, top 5, top... I don't know. I still remember, actually, it was a very fond moment that when they beat... The, the, they they took on the uh, NZ in Marseille, I think it's 0-2 or something like that, when they beat them last time in France. Because I think that's the game where there was six guys from Stade Francais starting in the pack. Uh, and I was I was uh, playing in the academy at Stade Francais at the time, so I was looking at them very very um, with a lot of of well, you know attention, um, and and that was special. But it's 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 a it's a special thing to beat an international team. It's a special thing to win three games in uh, in a packed house in Stade de France, and it's a whole different dimension to beat the ABs. So this is this puts them in in a real in the real first division of the international rugby. And it puts them in a special heart for any French rubber lover in history. Um, so irrelevantly of where does it sit compared to other games that I felt, it was just a, a, a hot air balloon of happiness. And I thank them for it. Right. It's about time we did our meter moment of the week, isn't it? I can't possibly guess where it might be going this week, but Benji, do you want to take it away? <laughs> So it's in a bar called the Buddha Bar when I got this massive <laughs> candle and I sang happy birthday to Johnny BT. Serenade it was, me, it was precious. It was lovely. It was precious. I, of course, I mean... And you were naked. It was... Like, <laughs> <laughs> it, was uh, it, it, it can't be anything else than Romain Tamak having the courage to, to pivot, picking up that ball after a, a try. I think if I don't get, if I'm not wrong... I would have put uh, the All Blacks back in the lead at that time. And he pivots and he steps out and <laughs> he does a blind pass for Melvin Jamine 40 meters after. No look, you know, oh, he put p- p- it back to it. So it's not, forget about in the end zone when he just hands off. I can't remember who was there, Jordy Barrett chasing him or something. I can't, it's not when he steps on the gas and go over, or goes over one guy in and, and the 22 is when he does the no look pass. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, okay. So that's that's obviously definitely the, the meter moment, the hottest moment of the weekend by a flipping mile. Do you disagree, Johnny? No, absolutely <laughs> not, mate. It was phenomenal. Uh, the no-look pass, the gas, the French flair that everyone loves, absolutely. No arguments from me at all, 100%. That was Benji and Johnny's Meter moment of the week. And Meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, and they've made over 9 million cooks better with their revolutionary app as well. So it's no surprise their users are growing rapidly every day. If you've ever said your pork or turkey's dry, then meat is for you. And you can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. Enter a whole new world of cooking and join the Metaverse at meter.com. Just use the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout for 10% off any full price item as well. It wasn't just a good weekend for France, though, was it? It was the first time ever that all the Six Nations countries have beaten Southern Hemisphere opposition on the same weekend. So has there been a bit of a shift or is it just end of the season for the teams from the South? Is that the first time ever? Is it really? First time ever that all of the Six Nations teams have done it. And you looked that stat up on oh my word, Tim. You got to buy yourself You got to buy yourself a Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I don't know. I think every game needs to be, needs to be looked at. Obviously, um, the, the England, uh, South Africa one could have gone either way any second. It was a really, really tight margin one. But it just proves that, that it's, there's no, I don't think it's a shift, but Northern Hemisphere is back. At least you can, you can say it that way. Um, but it was just some quality rugby. I think everybody loved the weekend. The, the liners are extraordinary. Uh, and no disrespect to a, any team at any time. The Auto Nations Cup last year wasn't the same. 
um, now seeing, you know, South Africa, England, Wales, Australia, Argentina, was it Ireland and France, New Zealand, and and all the other games in one weekend. Yes, boy, that's what we want to see. That's what everybody wants to see, and that, and that is priceless. So you know, when they talk about changing the, you know, a World Cup of clubs, uh, changing X, Y, and Z, just get us that. That's what everybody wants to see, um, and, and and I hope that will last for a long, long time. And importantly, with that product that is awesome to watch, the margins closed, right? So if we were watching rugby 10 years ago, South Africa would be sticking 50 points on Scotland, 60 points on Ireland. Now every game's a contest. They're all tight. You've got exceptional talent. Everyone's well-organized, well-coached, and they're interesting game to watch. That's the difference for me is that every single game that weekend, obviously my match point predictor was completely wrong because I had to go rogue and call things completely the wrong way, but they all could have gone either way. Again, the difference in three, four, five points in all these games, interesting games to watch, high quality rugby and great fun for a spectator. And again, if you're back in the stadium, world class to watch. It was awesome. Because it's what I do, Benji. Another stat I looked up, France are now favourites for the 2022 Six Nations. So The the bookies' favourite. The bookies' favourites. So, A, how much are we looking forward to it? But B, as well, is that a a mantle that's going to sit comfortably on their shoulders? Yeah, I think France, England, Ireland, always favourites for Six Nations, whether the bookies say it or not. Uh, Scotland, who played Japan? Apologies, I forgot them in the list. Um, obviously, a good a good side, and you, you just never know. I think France are going to go in Scotland and in Wales that, uh, that year, and it's with a big finish off for France, England. The last one, Ireland are seriously stepping it up. Are seriously also a, a big improvement over those November tests. They beat the the All Blacks. They probably did a little bit. Of, we thought that they doomed us because they were going to piss them off. They probably broke their bodies just a little bit more. Also, you got to take that in consideration. And then they put fifty on Argentina, and Argentina no no bumps. So uh, they're going to be up there. You know that a Six Nations, you can predict whatever you want. It all depends a lot on who do you play where. Do you play them home and away? Who do you play when? What's the start? Is France England the first one? Is it the last one? Is it in the middle? You know, that all that has got an impact. And I will tell you the favorites, maybe not round four, because that'll be a little bit easy, but <laughs> definitely <laughs> the end of round two. That's when you can know. And and round two is France Ireland. So you, you'll know by then, mate. But um, I, I don't think they'll even think twice about it. That's my question. That's my answer. Thanks, Benji. Thanks, Johnny. And a big thanks to all of you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube, and we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, guys. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Cheers, boys. Father.